themselves actually. So what Laura said, the filing fee is $300 now, um, and the service of process fee is usually around 100. Um, so it's, which is not great because then tenants, sometimes that's almost how much they owe in rent. Um, so that's another $400 on top of that, but on the other hand, then they can redeem and, and keep living there. Um, so that does come up. The other thing is that the most common thing that we say is, this is called a pay and stay. Basically, you pay this amount of money, you get to keep living there. I um, like to make cute little rhymes. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Pay so mail, so mail and mail, pay and stay. I have never heard mail and mail until today. So, but There's I like a lot it. more, we'll, we'll keep bringing them up. Okay. <laughs> Write that down. Um, so usually, so pay and stay, so you pay your rent and the outstanding costs, you get to keep living there. Tenants can ask the court for seven days um, your, the landlord can agree to give them more time, but if the landlord says, absolutely not, you have to pay this in you know, 24 hours or something, a tenant always has the ability to ask for seven days. The court is limited by statute to give them any more. So it does not matter if you are pregnant and homeless, and I mean, the court can't, under any circumstances, give you more than seven days. Um, a landlord can agree to give you more time, the court cannot. Um, and what we say to people, they're like, that sounds really harsh. Without the seven days, and it is, without the seven days, though, it's an immediate writ, or sometimes 24 hours. So seven days is a little bit better um, than what you would get without that, I guess. So that is a lot of times the timeline that we're talking about. A lot of um, landlords' attorneys know that, so most of the time they're saying, okay, I'll give you seven days to pay and stay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the other note about that too is that tenants can request that an agency guarantee be made within that time. So a lot of times that'll be very frequently from emergency assistance. Um, and that means that the guarantee is a letter saying that they guarantee to pay it, um, not that the money has to necessarily be in hand in that amount of time. They just have to have verification within seven days. Um, and as Laura and I have been kind of ha hammering on about expungements, um, tenants can ask for expungements upon payment, so meaning once they comply, just because otherwise um, that stays on the record. As Laura mentioned, and I actually had a client this morning, the first time I ever heard this, you might have heard this before, say that she considered it to be um, a housing felony. That's how she, that was the term that she used was having an eviction on your record is like a housing felony. Like some of the places will only go back when you are applying. I have seen them go back as far as seven years, where if you have a UD within seven years, you automatically will not get rented to that is part of their screening criteria, which they're allowed to do. Um, so expungements are really great. If you can try to do that, especially if you're coming to any kind of settlement, that's really nice because you can just say, okay, and when they do this, this can be expunged, right? Um, so that it comes off the record. Um, if people do not, obviously, if tenants don't comply, then the owners can get a writ if that's not the thing, which Laura had already talked about. The writ is what sends the sheriff to your house and removes you and your belongings. Yes. When you get it off the record, if they can get the expungement and get it off the record, does the court send those records to these agencies no. that keep track of all of this? No. How do you know how many agencies have it and, and how <laughs> can you yeah, get it? I mean, our office has a list, so we keep, there's like, there's like 11, yeah. I think. Yeah, the court has a list, too. Yeah. And they'll, if you, if you do expungement uh, hearings in front of Judge Guffman, his will give yes. you a list of all the tenants green. But that's only good for the day that it exists because they pop up all over the place. I had one client, I expunged their eviction from all the tenants screening agencies in Minnesota, but their landlord used somewhere in California to screen the eviction. Wow. And I was like, oh, I didn't send it to mm -hmm. that one because I didn't even know they existed. So it's hard, that part's hard. I mean, we do have a list that we could certainly, I mean, have probably print it up, um, but that is just the most common. We just send it to like the 11 most common and two of them are, you know, like nationwide. And so the court will take it off their website, you know, it comes off notice and it comes off the court's website, but the tenant screening agencies don't get notes. You have to affirmatively tell them to remove it. Yeah. And if the data was mine, in between the time that it was filed. You mean then, you know, the client? The tenant has to send it. Yes. I mean, if it's a case where we do it, where we represent, we send a letter, but otherwise for tenants that you'll be advising, they would have to do that on their own. Okay. Um, anyway, so yes, if they don't comply, what I was just saying is that if they don't comply, they agree to do a payment arrangement and they don't comply, the writ is issued and the writ is um, not what we want. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, I think this is the last one about <laughs> payment of rent, 
Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that tenants can voluntarily just leave. Sometimes people are saying, I'm done with dealing with management, or I'm not even living there anymore now, or I left this morning, or whatever. Tenants can voluntarily leave. Um, again, they have the right to ask for seven days. Um, this is more likely to be granted in the statute. It says if there's a disability, or if you have, or that's kind of our informal, it says hardship, actually. But the court generally construes that as being if you are um, disabled or have children. Um, so if you already, either you already vacated or you're going to vacate, again, you can request an expungement. Um, and if you don't move a writ, we'll issue it again. Yes? So if a, if a tenant gets a, a notice of eviction and leaves, mm -hmm. is that a basis for an expungement? Yes, you can ask that it be, if they're not, because what Laura had mentioned about eviction cases are about possession. So if you don't live there anymore, the case should be dismissed and expunged. Right then. So, am I? Um, okay, so now this is also, this has already been covered a little bit, that payment agreements over time can be dangerous just because that's the in full and on time. The court, you know, if you have payment arrangements set up for the next year, there's a really good chance that you might miss one of those payments. Um, the court requires pretty much strict compliance with any settlement that you enter into. Um, so that's non-payment of rent cases, which is the biggest one because that's just what we deal with the most. The other thing that's called is a holdover defense. Um, holdover is basically what Laura mentioned, that if you're given proper notice to leave and you don't leave. Um, so if you're on a month-to-month -month, you know, tenancy, if your landlord says you're going gone at the end of next month and, and you don't leave. Um, these are, there's, Pretty you know, strict things about proper notice has to be written, has to be dated, it has to be the one month plus one day, um, if we're talking about a month, or, um, and it has to be at the end of a rental period. Yeah. And I'll just mention this because this has come up a lot lately where tenants will get an email that says they have to move for a text message. Huh. I, I don't know that we get like right. that, but maybe. Hmm. So does an email count as a writing or? Well, that's, I mean, that's the dispute. <laughs> is, I mean, the court would have to determine that, but that's the stat, That's what the statute says that it has to be. So it has to end, the other one that I think comes up is it has to end at the end of a rental period, which is usually the end of the month. So you can't be given notice to leave on the 15th unless you pay your rent on the 15th. You know, it, it can't just be in the middle of a month. If someone's held over at the end of a term of a lease, is the end of the rental period considered, like, do, is, does it de facto become the end of the month? Well, so if you're saying like if they were in a lease for a year mm -hmm. and they hold over after that point, right. well, the landlord right. would still have to give them notice that your yearly lease is going to run now. Like, so I'm giving you notice that I'm not going to renew your lease. After you're on a year-long lease, you become a month, generally a month-to-month -month tenant because you're paying your rent once a month. So practically, you should be paying a month, yeah. Um, so holdover defenses, as far as if you're saying, okay, I'm a holdover, I, you know, I'm still here. Um, there are specific rules for tenants that are in properties that were foreclosed. There's really specific rules about this that we will have in the training materials that you'll have kind of as you're going through it at the courthouse. Um, generally, foreclosures, you have to be given 90 days notice um, to, to leave, or in certain circumstances, you can actually finish the lease that you're on. So that comes up sometimes. Um, the other issue is, actually, I wasn't sure what you wanted me to say about the domestic violence. Okay, <laughs> I don't know because I was like, I think, I think you put that in the slide. I'm not sure. Oh, what it was. Sorry. Um, okay, well, there's something there. Um, retaliation. I just had this case this morning. So in Minnesota, within 90 days of a tenant um, asserting their rights or attempting to assert their rights, so if they call the building inspector or, or you know do something like that, there's um, a presumption that if the landlord does something within 90 days from them doing that. Um, if they raise the rent or try to give them a non-renewal or try to evict them within 90 days, that's considered, it's presumed to be retaliatory. It's a rebuttable presumption, but it's presumed. Um, the other thing with waiver is that, so basically if you're given a non-renewal notice for a month and then you're supposed to leave and then you pay the next month of rent and the landlord takes it, that's considered, could be considered waiver of that to say you can't say that you want me out and then accept my rent for the next month. Um, and if it's if similar to the retaliation kind of defense is that if it's if the notice is being given for a reason that is otherwise unallowed, not allowed for dis you know, discriminatory purposes, then that can be a defense to open over. Um, so again, you have tenants have the ability to ask for a trial. Um, 
sometimes the court does not love granting these if the notice itself seems proper and you have to have a reason why you're saying that there's a defense. Um, or again, they can also agree to move. Um, and of course, if there's a settlement, you should request an expungement upon compliance. Um, okay, so the other one, I have yeah. a question about yeah. the trial. So when they, let's say they, they have a defense, they ask for a trial, um, then what happens? So it just gets on the trial block mm -hmm. with the? Yep, okay. it just gets that usually Wednesdays are the trial blocks in Ramsey County. Um, that's usually when the judges end up hearing those. Sometimes I think it might be Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. But so yeah, it just gets that on a regular civil trial block and then they're able to present the defenses that they have. So um, let's just say that the owner wants to file a summary judgment motion. I mean, they use the same civil procedures. Yeah, so it would be, I mean, there's housing, there are specific housing court rules too. So there's okay. obviously 504B, there's the housing court rules themselves, and then uh, other civil rules still apply as well. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty quick yes. okay. time period. Yes. So a lot of the normal kind of stuff isn't, it gets really jammed into a quick okay. time period. So yeah. there's usually I served a discovery request this morning, and I'm like, I want this stuff seven days before the trial. Cause, right, How far out does trial get set? Usually two to four weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although I got a trial for August twenty second. Well, I have I have a trial in four business days. <laughs> so it depends. It totally depends on what the court's availability is. Sometimes the next available can be in a couple days, and okay. sometimes the next available can be in a month. So it depends. Yeah. Forgive me because I came in late, but is there a, is there a right to jury trial or is this strictly court trial? You have the right to a jury trial. The right to jury. Trial. Mm -hmm. Is there an extra an extra fee involved? And yes. And yeah. more involved. time involved. Yes. I mean, we pretty much never do that, but tenants have the, I mean, they do have the right to request that. So, um, okay, so breach of lease is the other one of the other big, so non payment of rent, meaning you're behind on rent. Holdover is the other one if you've been given appropriate notice to leave and you don't leave. The other thing is you've breached your lease. Um, so, obviously, if we're talking about breach of lease, you need to see is there actually a lease? Um, and if it's if there is a lease that's supposed to be attached to the complaint, um, you need to talk with the tenant to ask them, is any of this true? Um, sometimes the answer is yes, and then you have to deal with what that means. Um, is the breach material? So that's the other thing. It can't be something, I mean, the court says it's supposed to be, that there's supposed to be, you know, material breach, not something, I mean, sometimes we have issues where landlords are saying, I think that they're doing damage to the property. And unless it's, substantial material, then that's, then we usually say that can be dealt with in a damage deposit. You know, like, it has to be something that's actually a breach of that contract, substantial breach of that contract. Um, and then the same thing that comes up, um, did the owner accept rent after knowledge of the breach, which also goes to the waiver argument. Um, there is, <laughs> I like it because it all caps. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a big deal. It, it is a big yeah. deal. I just forgot that I was there. Yeah. When you're talking about a material breach, but when we're talking about payment, it can be, like you said, you know, yep. after the office closed or whatever. So yes. that's not the same no. standards or whatever. No, yeah. it's not. I mean, some landlords, I think, try to make it so that it is. Um, like, the manager doesn't like this person, so I'm fine. <laughs> Eviction, um, but it is supposed to be material. I mean, it's supposed to be material breach. I mean, at least it's a contract, so it can't. It's not supposed to be something. If it's in immaterial breach, then you know, who gives a rip? It's kind of the idea. So um, the other thing is that when you talk about breach of lease defenses, of course, if this ends up being, if a, if a tenant is saying this is actually discriminatory, one thing that we why it is in all caps here for good reason, um, is that if a tenant litigates this in housing court and loses, then that can also interfere with their ability to file an affirmative discrimination case, um, and there's a site to the case for that. And that does that is difficult. It's something that we at least want to advise people that you have the right to certainly raise that as a defense, but it can also limit your, on the other hand, if, you, if the court says there is a finding of discrimination, great, that can help you in the future, but you are at least getting into um, getting into that territory. Um, again, as far as breach of lease, you have the issue of, so if there's domestic violence, sometimes you can try to explain that this person, these, this conduct is actually not my conduct. It could be a person, you know, someone that I'm not voluntarily allowing into the property or something like that. Um, 
There's also the ability to do a reasonable accommodation under fair housing if some of the breaches that you can say there's a nexus basically between what they're saying the breach is and say this is actually a result of their disability, you have the right to request um, a reasonable accommodation. And I'll just volunteer. We have a, a housing equality law project that's moral. We do a lot of these fair housing cases. If this comes up, talk to us. We're happy to work on it. Yes. So again, this is all going to be, so you have the ability to request a trial. <laughs> so you should definitely take that away. You can request a trial pretty much any, on anything. Um, and of course, with this stuff, yes. But you said that the court is generally, unless the notice is defective, the, general, the court is generally <coughs> reluctant to? That's just for holdovers. So oh, for that's holdovers. just for holdovers. Yep. Okay, holdover thank you. Because that's just generally like, did you okay. receive this notice, Aline? Got it. Because you can give a holdover for any reason, unless it's a reason that's otherwise prohibited. No, for breach cases, they will probably default to giving a trial. And then for the breach, is there a lease and is it attached? Is it supposed to be attached to all complaints? It's supposed to be attached to the complaint, yes. And I mean, are all leases supposed to be in writing? And well, so if there's not a written lease that they're, then, I mean, yeah, that's Just a really good mind. thing. Because if they said, you breached the lease and it says on the complaint that the lease is not written, I think you won. Yeah, then you can write. So if that's the only box that's checked is you breached your lease and you don't have a written lease, then you can't be violating a contract that you haven't entered into. Except you don't have anything documenting proof that you have access to or the right to possess that property. You don't have a lease. Yeah, I mean, if you have proof of your keys and you have proof of renting it to the landlord. Yeah. So, I mean, if if you're an eviction court, the owner is saying you live there. I mean, so they've already kind of admitted to that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so the owner, the plaintiff, you know, has the burden of proving that the person has violated their lease when it goes to trial, and the tenant has the ability, and like all other trials, to bring witnesses and evidence. Um, and again, there's always the ability to vacate. Um, so if you decide to leave, you can leave. I have a question. Yeah. So if they do accept the trial, who's going to? I mean, it would. I mean, if it's something that our office accepts, then it would be us. Otherwise, they would be pro se. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then let's say they ask for a trial, trial gets set, then they leave. Mm -hmm. Then someone can come, they can come back at, on the day of trial and say there's no longer jurisdiction for this because yeah, I Yeah, they could. And then get the response? They could, yeah. I mean, the court might be a little bit like, here, did you just do this for a stalling time? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Yeah. But yeah, they could, I mean, you could go to the, here, the trial and say, I don't live there anymore. I surrendered my keys. I want this case dismissed because they don't live, right. If it's about possession and you don't live there anymore, there's not a lot the court has jurisdiction over. Sorry, I'm... Yeah.